Hi guys, and welcome to Geek Talk, where we talk deep and geek about pianos, keyboards, synthesizers, and music production. And welcome to this Geek Talk Violator special with my special guest, Mr. Kevin Paul. Kevin, how are you, sir? Yeah, I'm all right. Good to see you. Welcome to my humble studio. Lovely, nice little cozy place here. I really like it. It's got a really good vibe to it. Thank you. Um, now, listen, guys, if you've been watching my work for the last uh, few months, obviously, I've interviewed Kevin on a previous video. We did that on Zoom about two months ago, is that right? It might have even been longer than that. Maybe four. Yeah, three, maybe three months. Three. It was right in the middle of one of the lockdowns, if I remember. That was but, right. But anyway, guys, I'm referring to that video because in that video, which was my first introduction video and my first chat with Kevin Paul, we spoke about Kevin's involvement with obviously Mute Records. He was the senior mix engineer and we're gonna get into that. And Kevin is the guy who did all the 5.1 mixing for the was it the 2005 re-releases. Yeah, that... the, yeah, Mute put together a, a remastering package that, um, that was actually a really nice limited edition package with a remastered album, um, a Super Audio CD version, yes. a surround version, a video about the making of each album. And, and I think for a collector, it was actually a really, really good package, actually. It was. Um, and I think a lot of people are yeah, upset that they missed the boat with that because they, the packaging was so amazing. Yeah, and, and you know, Mute don't really sort of do things by halves when it sort of no. comes to reissues and stuff like that. So, um, I mean, you know, like I say, for a collector, it's, it's a, an ultimate kind of Depeche Mode sort of... Dream come true. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, listen, Kevin, um, I just... We, before we jump into the meat and bones of this, obviously, when I got Kevin on the first time, I got a lot of feedback from you guys saying, oh, can you ask Kevin about this and this and this? And so I'm glad to have you back, Kevin. Mm. You, you've been cornered now. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> literally. That, the, these guys are hardcore. <laughs> these guys are very hardcore. Um, so I just want to say that, obviously, Kevin did do all the, 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 the remaster, the, the, the 5.1 remixes. But today we're going to focus specifically on Violator because this is part of my Violator album review series um, and also just a special shout out to Kevin um, Kevin has actually done the mastering for my latest single Sleeping Dogs which you guys have probably heard um, and he, he's not given me a tenor to say this but um, it's one of the most transparent brilliant mastering I've ever heard so um, he will also be mastering my Dark Society record so thank you yeah. Oh, is that a tenner or 20 quid? <laughs> we'll, we'll work it out after. We'll work it out after. We'll see what comes back from the uh, from the viewers. Kevin, um, before we jump into the the meat and bones of this video, yeah, um, let's just talk briefly about you. You were the chief or the senior mix engineer for Mute Records. Y yeah, yeah. Fr from uh, how did you get the job? Well, I, I originally, I'm not sure if we spoke about this before, but I originally started a, a studio called Conk Studios. Yeah. Um, and Mute used to do a lot of work there. Yeah. And sometime around 1994, I was asked by one of the guys who, who came to Conk a lot. He was the studio manager at the studio, and he said, would you like to come down to, to Mute? We're trying to make the studio a more um, commercial studio and have lots of outside clients as well as all of the mute artists. And uh, he just said, why don't you come down for an interview and would I like the job? And in the reality was the studio that I was at, Conk, was probably a better studio on paper in terms of equipment and people passing through it. But the Mute studio obviously had the tie-in with the label. Um, and it also, the position that I was being offered was um, as, a, as a, like a second engineer. So, you know, I would get a lot more experience in terms of actually working with artists in the studio as opposed to being an assistant, which I was at Conk. And after a little bit of deliberation, I thought, I'll go and work at Mute because I think the opportunity to work not only as a second engineer, but with Daniel and all the artists on Mute, it was kind of too good to turn down, really. Absolutely. Um, and I'm very lucky that I did because during my time there, I worked my way up to, you know, the senior head engineer 
Um, I worked with pretty much every artist on the label from, my God, Pansonic all the way up to Depeche Mode and everyone in between, like everyone. And, and, and indeed, I think, you know, you've, you've opened a can of worms there because I do, I have been talking about doing a, a Mute Records special because mm. Mute Records and Factory Records are very important to me. And I think later down the line, I think there's a lot we can talk about, about mm. your time in Mute Records. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's a... Mute, Mute as a label was, is obviously an iconic English label, yeah. if not around the world. But, you know, the, the label was a pioneering electronic music record label. I mean, you know, categorically, hands down, one of the biggest independents in, Euro in, in Europe at the time, I think. Well, I've, I've, I've often said that Mute is probably, and I always say probably just so that, the, you know, lets me off the hook, but I always say probably the most important record label in electronic mu music history. Yeah, I, I don't think that's far off, yeah. quite honestly. I mean, I'm sure there's people that, that have a difference of opinion, but for me, it's definitely mm. right up there. Right, so um, you, that's obviously a job, a career move that you're happy that you made. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so let's talk about, um, obviously, you were approached, you were the, mix, the head engineer. So how did this 5.1 project come about? Well, the... the the 5.1 project came about because around slightly before we started the project, Sony had released Super Audio CD, oh, yeah. and that was supposed to be a 5.1 CD mm. uh, medium. And they were piling in lots of money to record labels to make content for 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 the for the for the medium. So. We got some money to, to make some 5.1 records. And the first thing that we did was gold frap. We made a 5.1 version of, of, I think it was the Black Cherry album. Okay. Um, and to get that record, basically, there were, there were maybe four engineers in London doing surround sound music. Um, and... I really like the medium. I thought this is a great medium. Music sounds really, really cool in it. Um, and I wanted to be a part of that. And I saw an opportunity to potentially mix the record. Um, and so what I said to Daniel was, is, you know, do you mind if I do a mix of, of, of the single that they were testing with all these engineers? Um, and he said, yeah, sure, no problem. So <clears throat> I probably spent about a week working on this one song. Because that was like to kind of yeah. prove yourself. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, 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 you know. And, and I, was, I was quite... Oh, how old would I have been there? That was probably around 2001. Mm. So I would have been about 31. I'd have been at 31. So I, I've, I've been at Mute for a few years, but, um, you know, I was still f relatively quite young. Mm. And I thought, I, you know, I really want a piece of this pie, basically. So I spent about a week working on this on this record, and in the end, what happened was is Daniel just had a blind shootout between all of the versions that had come in, and there was only maybe three versions. There was two other engineers had put one, and I had put one. And amazingly, Daniel chose my one. He said, "That's the one I like." Who did that one? And, uh, and, and I said, "It was mine." Oh, a blind shootout. That's yeah. Just and that's flattering because, you know, we know, we know that um, And we, 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 uh, when I interviewed uh, Pino Pescatola, who was the engineer yeah. on Violator, they talked about, I think Daniel had it mastered by five different yeah. mastering engineers. And he also talked about the blind shooter. Yeah. So, so yeah. Daniel is very meticulous. So for him to choose you, hey, man, well, what, it's, what a compliment. It's the highest compliment what, that what I, what we could compliment. possibly have, really. And I, I think... I mean, I don't want to speak on behalf of Daniel, but I think even he was surprised that he chose my one. Mm. And, and he just went, hey, you're the best man for the gig. I like what you do. Let's do the Black Cherry. Um, and pretty much from that record, I, I ended up doing all of the Black, uh, the Gold Fat back catalogue. All in 5.1. All in 5.1. Yeah. Uh, we did Moby in 5.1. Was that the Play album? Or? The Play album and some of the later ones. Mm. Um, we probably did about three of those. We did, so there was only probably two gold track ones at the time, maybe three. Mm. Um, we did that Moby. We did all of the Nick Cave ones and we did all of the Depeche Mode ones. So I basically, from that one job, 
spent the next two and a half years <laughs> mixing surround sound records for okay. me. Okay, um, I asked you this question last time and we're going to elaborate on this now. Um, isn't it a little bit, I don't want to say nerve-wracking, but if we take a band like Depeche Mode where the... I often talk about Depeche Mode as an institution. Mm. It's just such... It's, they've got such a hardcore following. So... And people are very precious over them. So w did you feel the pressure when you were asked to remix this? Um, I think initially, not really. Um, I think... I mean, the first thing is you never know how much of an undertaking it is until you start the work. Um, and I think I was trying to think actually on the way up here, we didn't start mixing from album one all the way to album 11. We started somewhere in the middle and we started, I think we started with possibly the four biggest records, which were Music for the Masses, Violator, Songs of Faith um, and Exciter maybe. Uh -huh. And we we started with those because uh, I think originally they were going to be the first four that came out. Mm -hmm. What happened was is they actually became the last four that came out mm -hmm. because they ended up being incredibly complex to do. Um, and and you said this on the um, first interview, Kevin, is that obviously the, the the early albums were obviously more you know were more simple. Mm -hmm. And ob by the time we got to Violator, you know, with sessions, uh, every song having like up to 120 mm. parts, it mm. got a lot more complex. Yeah, and, and I mean, we had a production team working on on the whole thing. I mean, I, I did not do everything that needed to be done mm. by myself. It was t that, I mean, I'd probably still be doing them now yeah. if that was the case. So, so you'd have someone to like prep it and... Well, no, what, what we had is we had, we had someone at the tape copying company who would listen to the stereo master and then refer to the multi-tracks that we had. And, and sometimes there were maybe 10 multi-tracks for each album. Wow. And we'd go, maybe more, and we'd go through the multi-tracks and go, OK, that song's there, that song's there, that song's there. Oh, where's that one? Mm. And we've, we don't know where it is, so we have to go back to the archive, find that version. Um, and then it maybe wasn't quite the right version. So we got the song, but there were parts missing. So we go back, and so, the, so someone was responsible for collating the original master. Mm. Then someone was responsible for editing the master. So everything was there, was in time, and nothing was missing from the track. And then I was solely responsible for mixing it. Okay, just for mixing it, okay, yeah. yeah. And then what generally happened is the producer of the record would then come down at the end of the mixing just to have a listen to it and make comments on, on OK, this isn't quite right, or let's do this, you know, let's change that, or whatever, whatever it was. So, of course, this was very, this was a, a very fun project, but you met, um, you obviously had Gareth there, you had Dave Bascombe, you had yeah. uh, Tim Simonon. Tim Simonon, uh, uh, Flood, Steve Fitzmorris, Daniel, he produced the first... Three records, yeah. maybe four. Yeah, yeah. Um, who would have been at the end? I think that's probably the end. Ben we, Hillier, was he? Ben Hillier, yeah, yeah. yes, we would have had Ben. The only person we didn't manage to get was Mark Bell, oh, could, who yeah. produced Exciter. So he passed away, unfortunately. Yeah, he, he, he didn't come down. But uh, oh, we he had... Was, he was alive at the time, sorry. But, yes. but we had... Yeah. Steve Fitzsimmons, who mixed yeah. the record, oh, okay. he came he down to, to give it the the, the, the once over, and mm. and you know the idea of that, the idea of the idea of the project, it wasn't a, a, a remix of the albums. Mm. We, we we referred to them as reconstructions, a different interpretation of it. Yeah, we weren't yeah. trying to do that. Yes. It wasn't Kevin Paul's and Mute's version of what they thought mm -hmm. Violator should sound like. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the intention from the from the outset. The outset. The whole intention was we want to make these records sound like they were made at the same time as the original records. Yes. Some of the songs were easy. Some of the songs were really hard. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> I, can, I, I can imagine. But also, I think the challenge is when you're dealing with you know things that have been in in, in archive for such a long time, and then to get them out again, and then to you know we uh, if, it, if this was done in 2004. Yeah. So you were looking yeah. looking back at stuff that was done 15 years prior to that, and yeah. to get all yeah. those parts. And uh, you also talked about if there were certain parts missing, mm. you'd have 
uh, some of the original pro programmers go on for the fanboys and fangirls out there. Uh, Alan Wilder came in and... Alan Wilder came in. Yeah. Uh, are we talking sp specifically about Violator? Um, well, 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 we'll have to get onto that eventually. Okay. Well, I mean, just I'm in, enjoying the general chat. Just in now. general, yeah. you know, Alan, Alan Wilder came in for a lot, you know, a few of the records that he worked on, Songs of Faith. I remember mm. categorically he had to come down mm. with a whole load of material. Uh, Violator, yeah, there were some things. Ultra, Ultra we had to get the keyboard player to come down to replay some of the parts. Uh, yeah. They weren't big parts, but they were like, there's something missing there. Mm. Where is it? And we couldn't find it anywhere. But fortunately, we managed to get hold of the keyboard player, the, the actual guy that did it in yeah. the studio. Yeah. And he brought down his keyboard, plugged it all up and went, yeah, I know what this sound is, and went, doo, doo, doo. And it was there, and it took him like 20 minutes to yeah. replay the part. It was all there, yeah. You know, because he, he still had the presets on his synths. It was amazing. Wow, wow, wow Really. Wow. Um, we were lucky that we didn't have to sort out any vocal recordings or anything mm. like that, or any live recordings, like live drums or acoustic guitar mm. or piano or anything like that. We, we, were, we were very fortunate. And, and actually, I say fortunate, but really and truthfully, it's a testament to how well the the, the recording was done mm. and, and the care that was taken by the people that recorded it to make sure everything was there. Mm. You're always going to sometimes be faced with one or two things, but in reality, I think we can safely say that the, 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 all of the records were very well maintained. Right, so Kevin, a huge undertaking, but let's move it now specifically into to Violator because mm. I think everyone will agree, whether they're a fan, an engineer, a publicist, whoever, everyone hails Violator as, you know, the bomb as far as uh, Depeche Mode's records are concerned. So um, let's talk about Violator. Um, was it the most i mean how, how did violator compare to the other sessions so far as it's the sounds in isolation or the way it was put together or well like i say most of the albums were very well put together yeah. and, and and pretty much every record had every single thing mm. that you had there were maybe one or two sounds you go oh where's that what's that the thing about violator and definitely songs of faith and devotion they were huge undertakings i mean they they were at the time when the band was at their peak mm. and they did whatever they wanted production wise and musically mm. and the albums i think we can all agree reflect that in terms of the density and, and the complex nature of them so those two records um were albums that you had to take a lot of care over because you knew the fan base will be listening to them with serious intent. Yeah. You know, um, and I think by that time we had done, you know, half a dozen of the records had been signed off, the first four had gone out, um, the feedback was fairly well, you know, as far as I can remember, good. Um, but when we started doing that block of four, it then started, the pressure of making the records right kind of started to, to show itself a little bit. Um, Violator, for me, is not only, you know, Depeche Mode's, like, one of Depeche Mode's greatest albums, I think it's one of the most, one of the best produced records of all time, personally. Oh, uh, not electronic records? No, just, just of all time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it, it, f f for me, yeah. I use Violator as a reference when I'm talking, I teach at, at university and I do the odd lecture and I use Violator as an example of how production should be. You know, because Violator's not just an electronic record. No. I think a lot of people have this misconception mm -hmm. that Depeche Mode are an electronic band. Well, they're not just an electronic band. And if you've, if you've seen them live, which I'm sure the viewers have, they're one of the best live bands of, of all time, basically. Mm -hmm. um, for some reason, they don't seem to get as much credit within their country, 
excuse me, the, within the United Kingdom as they do out, outside of it. It's a really bizarre situation, really, for, for the band. Um, but Violator is just, it's almost the perfect album. Well, you know, I, they say great minds think alike, Kevin. I'm always, <laughs> I'm not trying to say I'm a great, but I'm just saying, or, or fools never differ. Yeah. But it's like, uh, I'm, I'm always on about Violator. And you, you've you actually, because I've, I've said, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's the greatest electronic album of all time. Yeah. But you've actually up, up the ante. I, I, saying, I've taken it a little bit further. Uh, like Not just electronic. Yeah. yeah. Just, because if you, you know. if you listen to... Um, what I love about Violator, Kevin, it's um, it has a very, and this is difficult to explain because it's it's a concept. It has a very organic and earthy type sound. Mm. Now, what I mean by that is, if we take something, let's take another mute artist. If you take Erasure, you know the sounds, and I'm a huge Vince Clark fan. Mm. I don't mean disrespect by this, but it sounds very electronic. You can hear like the diggy diggy. You can hear the sequences and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so it sounds very synthesizery keyboardy when you listen to violator a lot of those sounds are just they sound like they're from the earth because they're not definable as synthesized sounds there is there are a lot of sounds in there that i'm going what you know what is the starting point for that sound because they're so out of this world well i i think the band set out to do that oh yeah okay. I th- I it think was they, intentional yeah because they came off the back of music of the masses yeah um which obviously was the record that took them into the stratosphere of, of stadium super yeah. artists. Yeah. Um, and they probably just said, we want to go better than this. Mm. Um, and amazingly, they did. Mm. And, and for me, they wanted to prove that they could merge the electronic and the organic together and create something unique. And it was you when know. it came out. Oh, yeah. It was. It was. It was absolutely. When I heard that, it was like I had never heard anything like that yeah. before. I mean, they they blew everything out of the water at that point, mm. know, really. Um, and, and a lot of the sounds, and I know that obviously because I've heard the multi tracks. A lot of the sounds are acoustic sounds that have been manipulated through synthesizers, either through filters um, or they've been sampled um, and, and various processes processes like that, really. Mm. Um, so, and I, th- I think, I mean, personally, the album, there's no fat on the record at all. Like, every sound has a purpose. Every song has a meaning and... There's nothing there that you could go. Oh, that doesn't need to be there. Mm. That shouldn't be there. Mm. If that didn't, if that wasn't there, it wouldn't make a difference. Every single sound, moment, hit, beat, effect, just lends itself to the development of every song, and that's what makes it an amazing record. Like full stop for me. D- Dave Garns spoke about at the end of Music for the Masses the approach. Obviously, before every record, Depeche Mode always had mm. this philosophy with every record was never to repeat every record. It was always to make every record very sonically different to the previous mm. one. Now, I've said I would have been happy if they had, you know, expanded on the Violator project and done, an, you know, another two Violator albums. And and that's just what shocked me, is that they did this amazing album and then they just did a 180 and did Songs of Faith and Devotion, which was completely different. We'll get you in for another episode to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, Songs of Faith and Devotion is, is, a, is a completely different beast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but with Violator, uh, what uh, what Dave Garn was saying is they wanted something that was uh, I think his words were more clean and more minimal. In he in his words, not as cluttered as music for the masses. Now Dave Garn, I'm not I'm not I'm not putting you down yet, but I'm just saying music for the masses was not cluttered. It was just epic. It was a big wall of sound. Um, Violator, however, and you're the man to speak to about this, Kevin. Violator is very minimalist sounding it's very sort of like as some people say it's the most craft working uh, record the passion mm. might have ever done however what i've pointed out to people is that despite the fact that you can pinpoint every sound everything's sounds very minimalist every individual sound mm. is made up of so much there's so much complexity in every individual sound yeah and that, that is true and, and, and i think also the other thing is while when you when you hear something, uh, you know, a, a verse or a chorus, and it's minimal in its in its composition, what's good about the record is that nothing's ever repeated. Okay, so so, and what I mean by that is, 
and let's take a song waiting for the night to fall for instance okay it's an incredibly open record mm. right but if you listen to the effects on the record they're different every single time the vocal effects the vocal effects um uh in particularly the vocal effects yeah which generates uh an interest in, in, in the production of those and the way they've been put together make it incredibly complex but it, it it's done really. in such a and it's done in such a subtly way, a subtle way yeah, that you yeah. don't actually notice it you don't but, notice it but that's it's right. almost subconscious so it's it, it's almost like using automation to make something louder and softer and you yeah. know it's, but so i it's, noticed it because it, i had to re reinterpret that so it's not it, it drove me nuts so exactly. quite frankly so it's not we're going to get <laughs> Some, to, sometimes it drove me absolutely crazy and we, we're going to get <laughs> we're going to get into some of those details now so it's not really a copy and paste thing where no, you take this no. verse and it's it's come no. it's it's it, it's really it it evolves all the way from the beginning yeah. all to the end every song does it as well that, that and, and that's what i mean that but what they introduce in the next verse the next chorus the next bridge the outro it's just i mean it's just a brilliant composition okay for, for me i mean i can only speak for myself but. okay well listen um i'm embarrassed to say i have not heard the 5.1 versions yet because i never had a 5.1 system my community have been having a go at me to get a 5.1 plug-in anyway you're the guy i'll speak yeah. to how to because i want to i want to uh, experience these in in the way you intended them to sound so we'll mm. speak about that afterwards now um here's the challenge violator is this monster of an album uh, as you say yourself one of the best albums ever yeah, uh, yeah without and, and you say that without any doubt in your mind um when you got these sessions uh, you obviously have the individual stems or the yeah, what's the not the stems tracks. all the parts. they would have been the individual tracks from the multi-track were they dry um yeah for the most part yeah okay and so, so the only sounds that had effects on them were sounds that were the the, the effect was an integral part of that yeah, sound. Exactly. Speak, yeah. Absolutely. But 100%. the vocals would have been dry. Yeah, all the vocals would have been dry. You know, the drums would have been dry. The guitars, the synths. So, but you had to, everything. So, so you've now got all these dry things, mm. and you've got to now try and reverse engineer. Yeah, that's right. And 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 we're coming on to now. We're walking into this now. The vocal effect on Personal Jesus mm. on Dave Garn's voice mm. that was very, uh, you know, a lot of people will just listen to it and go. They hear it as a whole and they go, oh, Dave's voice. But talk us talk us through how important the vocal effect was and how difficult it was to... And how Flood came to the rescue at the end. Flood did come to the rescue at the end, <laughs> thank God. Um, but, I mean, you know, that particular song, the vocal effect is the sound of the record. Just know, as, much, as much as what the guitar sound is. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, but the, see, on the multi-track, the guitars sounded like they do on the record oh, because they had a full effect because they had the the chorus effect on them okay. and the layered effect on them mm. um but the and I'm, I'm not even sure i'm not even sure if people realize that the 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 drum beat in or the rhythm in personal jesus is in fact the band stomping on, stomping flight cases. on, on the flight cases. yes yeah. and a shout out guys check out the video interview i did with pino pescatola um, he was Pino. Pino was was also great. He had such a great recollection yeah. of of everything. And Pino said that 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 it yeah. was stomping on flight cases, and they were. It was done. They mic'd it at different yeah. uh, distances. Um, so in the studio, and then they did another version where they went to a stairwell, yeah. put mics at the top of the stairwell. And, right. So it was. And all they these... layered it up as well. It wasn't just one recording of it. It was like as you know as many tracks as they okay. wanted to play, and then they would sample it all up. And 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 put Alan it... would sample it all up with Flood and, and and anyone else that was involved. Yeah. And make sure it was in time and it was doing the rhythm that it was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, and would that be all on one stem? No, I think from recollection there was po possibly four versions of it. Okay. So, you know, you'd have a dry one, an ambient one, you'd have this maybe two or three different rhythms actually in the Within song. Within that, yeah. So, you know, one would be rhythm A, one would be rhythm B, and again there would be two or three two versions of it, maybe a dry and ambient. So, uh when you're mixing it, you have to get 
that balance right. Because they play off against each other. Yeah, absolutely. Pretty yeah. much, and we don't want to jump songs, a little bit like the, the bass line to uh, Waiting for the Night. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if yeah. you listen to it in the one speaker, it goes... And the other side goes, doo, 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 doo. and yeah, it's, that, exactly. it's, it's that, it's that, which they do a lot actually. The Peshmerga, they did yeah. a lot of it on um, "Never Let Me Down Again." That's that's another song where they do bass lines playing off each side of each rather other, rather than it being panned dead rather center. Than, yeah, rather than it being one bass line, yeah, yeah. it's two bass lines. Um, but with with "Personal Jesus," the vocal effect for, for me, it's the sound of the record. It's 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 what the listener identifies with the record mm. but like we said the the vocals were all dry so you you get the vocal up and you think well it sounds like some kind of reverse reverb type thing yeah, I, yeah. let me try that uh, uh, oh no it's not that um oh well what is it then let me try this oh no it's not that and and i i, I gen genuinely that song must have taken me about a month to do. And the vocals must have taken about two or three weeks to work out. Because every time I sort of got the song up, you sort of go, well, let me... No, that vocal isn't right. What's happening with the lead vocal? That's not right. Let me try something else. No, that's not right. And, and, and genuinely, I was tearing my hair out. So the relations it. would change as you yeah. found something, it would change well, in relationship. You'd think you had it, and then you'd listen to it the next day and go, well, it doesn't sound anything like it. And you were a being obviously constantly with the stereo master going, what what has he done here? And I'm literally trying everything that I have in the studio, like mm -hmm. every plug-in, every hardware unit, mm -hmm. absolutely, you know, whatever's available. No, 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 that's not it. Ah! And the solution was simple. <laughs> the solution. Well, well, the solution. <laughs> So I thought, okay, I need to get hold of Flood. And, and, and by his own admission, he's not the easiest man to get hold of. Yeah. Um, I know this. <laughs> I, I'm, sure you, I, I'm sure you do. So I tried and tried and tried to get hold of him. And, and, and eventually I sort of reached out to someone that knows him, that I know he sees on a daily or weekly basis. I said, look, you've got to ask Flood to call me about this. I cannot get the vocal sound. It's driving me absolutely fucking nuts, <laughs> right? And he said, yeah, look, okay, I'll send. So about two weeks later, completely randomly, the phone rings in the studio, it's Flood. So I'm like, Flood, where have you been, mate? And he's like, yeah, sorry, Kev, you know, uh, how can I help? I said, look, Sort of like pressing on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm I like, need the answer. Yeah, I'm like, I, I, I don't. I'm working on personal Jesus, and I just can't get the vocal effect. And he went, "Oh yeah, that's just a small hall on the SPX90 on a Yamaha. Set the pre-delay to this, and you want the reverb time to that." And, and he went, remembered that. Yeah, after like, all these years. like like absolutely straight off the bat. And I went, "Okay, don't move." I've got an SPX-90 in the studio, wait there. So I put the phone on the side, dialed in all the things, and literally I put up the faders, and it was just the sound of the record. Oh, really? And I picked it up, and I was like, oh, thank you so much. Like, I, I said, Flood, you have no idea how hard I've been working. Do you actually call him that. Flood so, here? You, yeah, that's his name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Call, Everyone calls people, him Flood. People call him Flood. Everyone calls Flood Flood. Yeah, yeah. If you, you, Mark, if you call him Mark, he, 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 wouldn't, he, he wouldn't know who you were talking to. <laughs> Mark who? I'm, I'm not Mark, I'm Flood. That, 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 that is amazing. And I think um, I think Pino Pescatolo, the, the engineer on Violator, he also had this recollection. And this is something that happened so long ago. I think most people, you'd ask them and they'd be like, oh, I don't know, um, maybe it was a this. Mm. But for him to actually say it was this preset with this and and he he actually like he just nailed it like first time and that was, and was and that, like, was the, oh. that was the effect you used as he said yeah. it and it was exactly like that and it was like oh thank god thank you so much and then after and like, that it yeah, came right. together quite well yeah and, and that was it yeah, that, yeah, that was the yeah. when, when i say it took a month the track probably took about a week mm. but the remaining three weeks were trying to sort out the vocal and once i'd got that vocal sound it all fell into place yeah track was done you know and you could move on, and and I didn't. I I I I quite literally went to bed worrying about what the sound was on Personal Jesus for about a month. I mean, I, I yeah, fellow geek, drove me it, nuts. It would play on my mind too. No. <laughs> really but um, yeah, you know, that, that was the hard. I think that was the hardest one out of the entire 
by a later project. Not the entire Depeche Mode project. Oh, the personal I, Jesus, I think, really. I think that one was the hardest one to nail. There were a couple of other songs. Uh, Waiting for the Night to Fall was quite a difficult song. Um, and there's a couple of songs on Faith and Devotion where you thought, OK, these are really dense. How how am I going to get that balance right? I think uh, I Feel You was one of them. Um, yeah. Just the nature of the drums and, and the sound of the drums was really difficult on that album, gotcha. uh, on that song. But on Violator, um, Waiting for the Night to Fall was quite tricky because, as, as I was explaining before, at the end of every line or every other line, whatever it is, there's a diff different delay effect or sometimes it's a multi-tap delay, sometimes it's a chorus delay, sometimes it's the delay through a chorus and being multi-tapped and you you would think that you'd got everything mm. and then you'd listen to the master and go, what's that? Yeah. I don't have that. <laughs> and you'd be like, oh, no, OK, back to the mix and go, it's not the same. And you think, oh, bloody hell, OK, another one to work out. Right, so waiting for the night. So I've mm. got my... Uh... Sound bank here, which uh, right. you um, from where? Uh, well, I can't can't tell you on camera. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, but I'll have to kill you. Um, but um, this now, basically, this is the Alan Wilder sound bank for waiting for the night. So, if you listen to this, <laughs> that's <odd>. wow. <laughs> that's clearly Martin's voice. Yeah, at, yeah. At the that's the, on the record. Yeah, at the end of, end of the record, it goes. Ah, now I'm assuming because this is for the live. This was the the Alan's bang for the live performances at the end of the song when martin goes ah, 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 alan would obviously be doubling that up yeah 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 probably wow yeah that's amazing what else is, what? What? yeah that's the end riff yeah Wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah, amazing. Oh, wow. Go on. I think that's... I don't know what that's I think that's the... There is a star. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lighting, what's that lullaby type sound? I mean, that's incredible. It, it is quite funny because these sounds in isolation. I mean, it doesn't do that. It doesn't sound great. No, but 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 well, no, yeah. But, but, but when it, you put them in the context, exactly. This is the thing, and and that's what the Pesh mode are very good at. Layering, very good at that. Yeah, and that's why I say there's no fat on that record. Everything belongs there, and it has, everything has a purpose. And you can almost imagine them in the studio just going. Do we need that? Mm. And what's it doing to this particular song mm. and this particular part of this particular song? Mm -mm. And there's no fluff. Or there's no. There's this, nothing that yeah. that's not needed. Yeah. You know, it, and that's why it's minimal, but at the same time very complex. I, I know that's a contradiction, but I think I think if you've listened to enough music, you you will understand. People will understand what that means. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about the Pesh Mode. I'm just talking about music in general. I think so. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, that's definitely the. So anyway, that's, that's uh, amazing. That's amazing. Let's pull up another song, shall we? Yeah, yeah. That's totally. That's unbelievable. Right. So um, three guesses which this one is. <laughs> It's Halo. It is. It's Halo. That's a wicked sound. You see, you've got things that I wouldn't have had. I would have just had that. You'd have the whole part. Yeah, yeah. the part played yeah, these... on the multi-track, whereas you've got, like, the source. Yeah, I mean, this is actually... Th these are actually the original sounds which they used on tour. Yeah, I'm slightly uh, jealous. Oh, don't worry, I'm sure, sure we can. I'm, I'm... <laughs> That's an amazing sound. But see, I mean, see, I think if... if if you listen to the texture of that sound, there's no, like, there's no modern day synth that can make that sound. Well, this is the thing. It has a 
Um, and sometimes, uh, shout out to my uh, geeky friend, Simon Forsyth, who was the guy who helped Alan Wilder restore his Emacs's for his auction. Um, he was also saying that the a lot of that sound is to do with this this Emacs. Uh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it, yeah. it gives it this kind of lower mid, this kind of honky sound. Yeah. And, they seem, and it's difficult to... It was 8-bit ex- or something like that. It, it won't was, be 16, it, maybe. It was 8-bit, but what's diff- what, what, what... I mean... Uh, there Amazing. is there is a presence or something to that sound that yeah. you can't get from no. a modern synth. No, you can't, uh, or a preset on a modern synth. And I think, you know, I think this is this is another feature of the Pesh mode. I think this is a something that they, you know, as you, as you said, alluded to. They always try to do something different. Yeah, you know, and, and in in Flood as a, as a producer, he always wants to do something different. Of course, he came around at the right time because he was yeah. the one who told them. Because Martin's a great guitarist, and he said, "Hey, man, if you, because they had this idea, you know, but we don't use guitars and stuff." And yeah. enjoy the silence would not be enjoy the silence without that guitar riff. Yeah. So I think Flood is yeah. is very important for that. I, I'll tell you something about Flood and and, and the Pesh Mode before before they made the record. They was I I think the band was slightly concerned about having Flood as a producer on the record because Flood up until that point his records were commercial no they were the 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 sound of the records were really dry oh. um and they didn't use a lot of reverb in his 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 productions and Depeche Mode, as you know... The music for the masses was very reverb. All, all of them, you and, know, and the Black Celebration, Black Celebration, Black Celebration yeah. all, all of them. And, yeah. and, and there's a reason why they used a lot of reverb. Mm. And, and that, 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 that reason is reverb equals girls. And when I explain what I mean, you'll understand. To Depeche Mode, they obviously wanted to be really famous and, and, and you know, have lots of girls and, and success. Yeah. So they thought... Well, to have that, you need to use loads of reverb because reverb makes things sound expensive. Oh. And when things sound expensive, you attract lots of girls. Oh, so right. reverb equals girls. Oh, really? This is... Yeah. <laughs> and they were slightly concerned that if they Flood doesn't use a lot of reverb, we, we, we're not going to get any girls. It's just blokes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, you know, but Flood didn't end up mixing the record. Francois Cavalcan did, yeah. did mix the record. Um, but obviously, he plus the producer. But that, that's quite a funny little side that story. Is, that is, I've never heard that before. I mean, hey guys, you heard it here first. Reverb is good for pulling girls. Yeah. Reverb equals girls. <laughs> I might get a t shirt that says <laughs> Reverb equals girls. I think that's a good thing. On the mix bus thing. <laughs> Rick, anyway, guys, um, we're going to speak a little bit later <laughs> about Kevin Paul's mix bus. Uh, he, this man has interviewed the people that I wish I have in, had interviewed. So we're, we're kind of going to join forces in a way, aren't we, Kevin? Yeah, I so think we are. Yeah, gonna I talk. think it's going to be really good and really exciting. You're going to, uh, yeah, whether you like it or not, you're going to be appearing a lot more <laughs> on this channel. But um, let's pull up another. Let's, actually, let's just look at some more. Yes, I mean, that, oh, yes, and check this out. This is, this oh, is, this that's is, beautiful. Yeah, this is Martin Gore's sound bank. Um, so he'd be going, you were killed, and then... Dum, do, do, and it's just... Yeah, yeah. There's a pain. Boom. Boom. And I, don't know, got, yeah. I think Fletch probably does the... Boom. Um, so over here, he's got... These are obviously samples from other records, I think. I mean, listen to that. But I, I think people forget, and you've actually opened my eyes to this, Kevin. Um, I always talk about Violator as an electronic album. It's not. If you listen to all these orchestral yeah, layers that's, and... that's what I'm saying. And, yeah. The, the, the oh. use of guitars, that's not... No. That's loads of sounds. That's, I mean, it's, it's what, synth bass. What do you think that is? It's hard to tell, but it's going to be an amalgamation of lots of sounds. Alan, leave a comment in the description below, please. Yeah, <laughs> he wouldn't have, yeah, Alan would know. Alan would know, yeah. We can't get hold of Alan, though. He's uh, he's very uh, 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 invisible, private, discreet these yeah, days. Well, and I don't blame him. Who, who, who can blame him? I don't blame him. But you can hear there's lots of orchestral stuff. Oh, lots yeah. of orchestral lots stuff, Lots actually. of it, lots of it. Right, should we... very interesting. Let's, let's check out another song. OK, yeah, one, two, two. Right, uh, three guesses which one this is. Let's see, I think it's... Um, uh, oh, yeah. Oh. oh, yeah. Um, right. Great. Oh, wow. Uh, 
Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> What's interesting here is... Da, 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 da. I'll let you have a go. Uh, it's, yeah, but it's actually the whole riff. It is. It's like a... OK, but but also he can either play it like this. Martin does it like this. He goes... It's this what he goes... Yeah, but I think on the record... It goes like this. It's going... Da, da, but then, yeah. but then you can instead of going, instead of going, you can hold it, and it's got that note on it. So yeah. it goes, and then at the Amazing. end. Once again, these are easy to play, but you know, if you don't play it, if you hit one wrong note, it's wrong. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's not yeah. like uh, rock and roll. Um, I love, I love the way that you can hear the the texture. The texture. You know, that's a sample. That's, 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 off, a, yeah. that's a sample. You know, that's that, those are sounds generated live in the studio, and they go, "Yeah, that's great. Let's let, let's record it." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and then they they have to get rid of the synth. Yeah. And use it to make another sound. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, and, yeah. And, and that that for me, when, when you when you think about that. And I look at the multi-track, which is 100 tracks big and, you know, 50, 60 sounds. Yeah. It makes you realise how long it would have taken to make just one song. I mean, Pino Pescatola said he'd never seen anything like this. It yeah. was just immense. You know, the approach and everything was yeah. just out of this world. Uh, just just so... And um, I think most of that came from, from Flood and Allen. Uh, Flood and Allen, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. What a, what a great team. Yeah, they two. really wanted to push the boundary of the technology, I and, think. And they certainly did. And, and, and here's a question I asked Pino, and I, I'll ask it to you now as well. Um, I asked him, would, obviously using today's technology, which is light years ahead of what they had in 1989, 19, 1989, um, would we still be able to make Violators sound the same? His answer was, yeah, we, we could do it, but it wouldn't sound exactly the same. I th because I think some of the limitations... I don't think you'd get close to it. I think, the, think so? I think the problem is, the problem with today's technology is that you wouldn't think of making a record because, like Violators. Because the limitations are yeah. important in... Because what they did with what they had at the time was groundbreaking. Because yeah. the limitations were there, so it's so working around those limitations, you need to think out of the box. Yeah, and you, I, th I think, I think someone knew, someone who didn't know about that history, they they wouldn't, they wouldn't have the creative capacity to go. This is what I'm going to do. Mm. They just use presets or manipulation. I mean, obviously there are artists who are manipulating things mm -hmm. and, and layering sounds and producing unique compositions. But to the extent of what Violator was doing, mm. I, I I can't see it really personally. Yeah. I mean, Violate, and, and I think also the thing that people need to understand is that in terms of the time, it would be like coming out with some totally new style of writing today. You, It wouldn't be about making an electronic record. It would be completely rewriting the rules of music mm. and production. That's the level that you would have to reach today to match what they did at the top. For, for me, you've got to remember when it came out. Well, when did it come out? 19... 1990. Yeah, 1990, right? Mm. It was years ahead of everyone else. Y years ahead. Yeah, it, Violator is the record that turns everyone into a fanboy. I mean, even engineer, even engineers and it's, stuff. I, I'll <laughs> say it again. It's one of the greatest produced records of all time. Like one hundred percent. And and I and, and I'll, I'll go toe to toe with anyone against that who says no. Well, there we go, guys. Leave your comments in the description below. I think there's an awkward silence there. No one's going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you've got those sounds. That's amazing. This, uh, this, this is kind of like a bagpipe or like some kind of brass sound. It's a, it's a synth. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a saxophone. Saxophone. Uh, you know, and you've got, the pitch, you've got the pitch wheel. Uh, yeah, it's got that built in. Uh, um, I, I think the whole thing is, is just remembering where you put it. But I mean, pra practice enough. Oh. Practice enough, it's just practice. Right, uh, three guesses for this one. This, this. Uh, 
Wow. That sound. Such a great noise. But just listen to that. I mean, that is quite insignificant, but brilliant at the same. It's just, mm. you know, just the and the, the attack. And well, what I notice about the Pesh Mode as a as a band is a lot of their rhythm tracks aren't percussive. Their actual music. Um, and when I say that, like if you listen to tracks like Never Let Me Down Again, mm -hmm. there's a kick drum and a snare drum in it. But everything else is music rhythm. So the bass line um, has two components. Um, oh, it's not just playing like a bass. Yeah, it's not going boom, 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 boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah. an actual rhythm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, a lot of the makeup for for for, for, for what I I can uh, put together is that you know <laughs> that's not a percussive sound that's a melodic sound yeah but when you hear it in the track it's going yeah it's actually playing a, a rhythmic part even though it's a melodic part. even though it's a uh, melodic yeah, yeah. part yeah that's um, true. and it's they're they're one of the first bands to really do that, and Kraftwerk used to do that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and there's yeah. no real high end percussion. There's no hi hats. Yeah, you very rarely hear a hi hat in a Depeche Mode song. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I mean, like I say, never let me down again. There is a shaker in it that comes in, but yeah. it, it's 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 one of the rare times when you hear a, a, a an actual percussive sound mm. playing a percussive part well this is what did uh, dave bascom's head in because they also had the you know they also had the pre-production talk and they said look we don't want any hi-hats in this and he was like what yeah yeah <laughs> yeah well yeah, it, it's that's and self evident yeah, and they're on yeah i mean the hi-hats are always an easy way to to get a uh instant gratification you go yeah Doof, dish, tick, 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 you get yeah, that, exactly. You know, you get yeah, that, but, we, yeah. but 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 by imposing these rules and saying we're not going to use that, it forces you to think in a different way, and that's exactly what you said. Coming back to what mm, you said earlier, yeah. Kevin was um, that is why Violator, had they made it today, they would not be forced to think as creatively as what I, they I don't did. think you'd get close to it. Yeah, you just couldn't. That's if good. you if Violator didn't exist, there's no way you'd get a record to sound like like it. It's amazing. I, th I think. I think. Also, I think if you said, "Here's Violator, remake the record," I don't think you could do it. You just couldn't do it. Yeah. You wouldn't know how half of the. You know, I mean, you can tell that's a bit of white noise in there, and there's a sound in there. But this, how, how would you know how to even think about making a sound like? That? I believe that that is a sample from a Fleetwood Mac record. Oh, there you go. But, well, that, that was a bit disappointing for yeah. me as well. But still, I mean. Um, it, it's just the layering and the way they put together, which is, um, I think there's the, 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 this is actually Martin's devotional sound bank. So slightly different, you know, the, obviously the, um, the world in my eyes version they did in devotional was slightly different, but anyway. Yeah, but that's on the tour, right? The that, that was, tour, that was yeah, on yeah. the tour. Okay, yeah. yeah. So th yeah. these are those sounds, but anyway, I'll, uh, I'm glad, I'm glad you've, uh, You've never had access to them. I've but... never heard them in that way. Oh, no, wow. that's amazing. That's amazing. Right here in this humble studio. <laughs> I'm, I'm very delighted to hear that. Bless you. I'll speak afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Kevin, we could speak for ages on this. And it, yeah, yeah. as I say, you, you are coming back again, and we're going to go into more detail in here. But let's talk about the, the doors that you used for the mixing of this 5.1. Yeah. Was it Pro yeah. Tools? Um, it, it, everything was done in Pro Tools, and the, the one thing that people need to remember is at the time that we did these things which is what 2002 maybe yeah. a bit later 2003 computers were nowhere near as powerful as they are today. processing power yeah, uh, yeah processing power um and f for the most part for most of the records that that really wasn't the problem but when we got to this album and faith and devotion the processing power was so intense 
that we ended up having to buy. I mean, I don't, I don't know how much technical detail the, the, the viewers have, but in those days you had a Pro Tools HD system. Yeah. Um, the, the, we had the old Cheese Greater Mac, so they could take two extra cards. Is it the G4 back in those days? No. Yeah, it might have been the G4. So they would take two extra cards but that wouldn't that was nowhere near enough power for for the violator nowhere near enough so we had to buy a chassis and have another five cards in the system which at the time is 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 not cheap mm. you know you know computers are, are expensive now but back then they were 10 times the price mm. um so we had a pro tool system with seven hd cards and still we maxed out on some songs, the processing power of the computers. And the reason why we did them in the box was because we had to have the ability to come back to them time and time again, you know, with the producers, with, with just myself, just working on different projects. Um, and, and one of the other things that we, that we found out actually was we were, we were mixing the records, and, and for all intensive purposes, they were sounding the same as, as the albums. Mm. Um, and I'm talking probably from music of the masses onwards. Yeah. And But we were sort of scratching our heads a little bit and going, there's something not quite right here. There's, 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 there's a part of the sound of the records that we weren't getting. Like a sonic overview? Yeah, like a sonic overview. And, yeah. and it took me quite a while to sort of think about it. And I said, I said, you know what? I think I know what it is. And, and, and I think it's the fact that these records were made on analog discs. Right. Right. And, and obviously, when you're working on an analog disc, at, at the time, there was no digital emulation of analog yeah. equipment. It was, it was just their interpretation of it. So. I said, we need to put these mixes through analog. And in order to do that, fortunately, SSL at the time had just come out with a channel strip of the E-series desks, mm. the 4000 and the 6000 SSL E-series. So we called up SSL and we said, look, can you send us over six channels? Mm. And they had just bought out a 5.1 analog compressor yeah. of their G bus compressor and a G bus compressor. So just to borrow, because this was a good endorsement yeah, it was just, for them. Yeah, and also just to see if that's what we were, you know, before we go and spend 15 grand yeah. on 15,000 pounds on a load of equipment, we want to see if it, that's what we're missing here. And so we obviously got it in and we put them through. And immediately the whole mixes came together. Yes, yeah, it, it, it's because it had the analog grip that they would have all been using at the time. Yeah, you know, and and that was a very key part of not only the Depeche Mode series, but when we went on to do the Nick Cave albums, again, you know, they were all analog, yeah. um, and and that was a very key component of making the records sound as close as possible. To the originals, I think I think Kerry Hopwood said um, when they were doing um, Ultra. Yeah, I think he got some advice from Daniel Miller, and he said run everything through a preamp because I think that was right about the time yes, that, that, that Daniel had, had had realised that you know there is something to be said about analog. You yeah. know, and it's even playing these sounds through this thing. It's the circuitry. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. And there's just something we can't get from the the digital well, well, emulations. Th that is funny that you say about that album because they had they had one preamp on that album. On on but an on ultra, 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 and they put every everything. sound through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It they, does. They, they 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 basically what they did is that they did it on one sound, mm. and they 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 just did it so like as as a as a thing like a production tool, yeah, yeah. and Daniel went run everything through that sound. Just that. What, what was the preamp? Do you, Do you know? know what I, I've I've actually always tried to remember, and I can't remember what it is unfortunately. Well, it was. Well, it, it, I think I think at the time they had borrowed it. It was a new thing yeah, yeah. that had just come out. Mm -hmm. It was maybe an Avalon or a Focusrite. Focusrite Red or something like that. Yeah, yeah, or even like the the blue I, one, you uh, know, the, the, like, the, the, like the one that you the, I, the ISA, yeah. It might have been something like that, yeah. but they were drive. basically what they were doing was driving the input. Into the red. Really yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah. To get all that analog to get distortion. The yeah. and, they, and, and Daniel went, 
that sounds great. Put every single sound on the record through that. And that's what they did. Yeah. I mean, that's a great album. That, I mean, that's uh, Ultra another is great absolutely, album. Ultra is absolutely, and we'll, we'll get you yeah. in for that one when we get... Uh, yeah, we're going to sure, get yeah. you in as well for the next one. As well. <laughs> How much time you got? But listen, man, um, we, we, we can really, really scratch the surface on this uh, even deeper and deeper. And, you know, I don't want to take advantage of you. You're not that far away. I can come back yeah. to your studio. Yeah, yeah. But, but listen, let's get on to um, something we spoke about earlier. We'll just briefly touch on this because um, I want to speak about this in more detail in another episode. Okay. Um, and that is your mix bus series. Now, guys, um, I am teaming up with Kevin. Yeah, I think it's going to be a great um, collaboration, Geek Talk and Mix Bus. How are we going to present that? We're going to decide still. But Kevin has interviewed a lot of the people that you guys have asked me to interview. Go on, names drop. Flood, uh, Alan Mulder. Flood, Alan Mulder, uh, Dave Bascom. Yeah. Um, uh, who, who else? Uh, Gareth. Of, uh, Gareth Jones, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Um, we've got people like Luke Slater, Daniel Miller, um, a, a lot of mute cohorts and, and, and people that are, are involved in, in sort of the mute family. Um, I mean, so, some of them have been released. Um, who are oh, uh, Dave McCracken, who worked with Ben Hillier. I've got Ben Hillier as well. Um, so there's lots of people that, uh, and, and there's some other producers, they're not all mute-based producers. Um, and basically the concept of the podcast is it's not necessarily a podcast to discuss what things were used and when, because people like yourselves do that far better than I could. And there's all other lots of people that are doing that. The, the, the concept of the podcast is to discuss how to get creative people to be creative within the recording environment. Which is, I think, a, 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 a great angle to come at it from, because yeah. not many people, I can't think of anyone who's doing that, really. No, there, there are a few people, funny enough, since it started, that have sort of jumped on that kind of angle. Um, but and initially, the, the idea sort of came about, I, I was sort of listening to a lot of podcasts around music production, and I suddenly thought, do you know what, I, I know quite a few people, maybe one or two people would do a podcast with me. Mm. So I went through my phone book and phoned like about 10, 12 people, and unfortunately, or fortunately, they all said yes. Mm. And I thought, oh, shit, um, I've got to do a podcast series now. <laughs> So, so from that, from literally just an idea of doing one or two, I, 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 I've now got. I, 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 there's been eleven released, mm. um, and then there's still another, probably twelve, maybe more, um, archived that are, are ready to, to go out. Mm. And, and it's not also what what I want to do with the series is not just talk about famous. Producers. Also, we spoke about up and coming. Yeah, artists. we spoke about up yeah. and coming artists. We really. feel we need to give back and you know, yeah, and, and, support the guys. Who well, are yeah, and also encourage other people who wonder if there's a place for them in the audio industry. That that actually there is. Yes, and actually there is a pathway for you because a lot of the time you're told that as an engineer, a producer, a writer, an artist. You're told that it's really difficult, yeah. or you're told that it's impossible, yeah. or you're told that you can't make any money out of it, mm -hmm. and 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 really, that's that's not true. It, it, that I isn't agree. true, especially in this uh, current economy. Yeah, and, uh, uh, guys, we're gonna, Kevin and I are going to be doing another video soon on the state of the music industry, and we'll talk about yeah, that. Yeah, we bit. will. Yeah, but I, and, and I think it's important that people are encouraged to, to believe that there's a place for them in, in their industry that they, that, they, that we all want to do. You know, we, we all want to be able to make a living out of, of what we're doing here. And part of the podcast role is to facilitate that encouragement, really. Yeah. Um, that, and that's it, really. Um, you, can, you can check it out. Yeah, I think, I, th I, th I think that's a good balance because, um, you know, we do get into these echo chambers and, you know, we yeah. love Depeche Mode bands like that. And... But I, I am aware of the fact, I feel the responsibility, and we spoke about this as well, Kevin, yeah. is that although we do look up to these great artists that we talk about, we do need to encourage the next generation. Yeah, I well, that, you know, yeah. somewhere out there, there's yeah. another Depeche Mode. Yeah. You know, absolutely. and it would be a real shame that they don't have the confidence. Because... Or, yeah. or, or, the, or they don't think that it can be them. It, it can be you. Mm. It's not easy. Mm. 
but there is a pathway. There's a pathway. And, you know, and that's important to me anyway, you know, the next generation of people and, you know, the learning of how to encourage... It, it, there's a million things out there that tell you how a compressor works. Yeah. There's very few things that tell you why you should want to use this particular compressor or a compressor in general mm. for this purpose and why you should do that. So, guys, um, I'm going to leave a link in the description below. Check out Kevin Paul. Um, and also, I've often said to you guys, I've been in this industry and worked around the industry long enough to know that the people who are actually doing it, the people who we look up to, are usually the most softly spoken and that they're not the ones shouting the most. And these are the kind, Kevin is the kind of guy that you can learn a lot from. He's a, he's a, become a good friend to me he, and he's a, he's, a, he's a mentor to me and a guru. He's mastering my, my records. And in fact, if you're looking for a good mastering engineer, I could personally endorse this man. And I always say you can give me that tenor later, but no, no jokes. I mean, just go listen to Sleeping Dogs. That's because the mixing was so good. But, <laughs> but no, um, uh, you're a great mastering engineer. But also, you also do you do on you do uh, recording, you do mixing. And, yeah, online and, mixing, yeah, you know, online record, or not online recording, but online production. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a mixing engineer. And he was good enough. He was good enough for Mute. He was good enough for Daniel Miller. And he was good enough. So he's good enough for us. I'm sure. Thank you. He was very nice. <laughs> yeah, I'll take a tenner for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of money. It's cost me a lot of money to sit here. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, thank you so much, my friend. It's been a real pleasure to have you. Thank you. And we'll see you on the next episode. Great. Thanks very much. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.